glad to have you. Um, we are going to dive into our third week talking about the Great Commission, as we have for the last couple of weeks. want to remind you, though, for those of you that just jumped on, May 31st, we are going to meet in real time, like uh, where we can really share our jelly beans or our coffee or whatever. On May 31st, out at uh, Kip and Chris Unruh's, uh, the place behind me, the background you see, uh, that, that is uh, an amphitheater on their property that is just beautiful. We've been out there for weddings before. And so we're going to meet out there at 1030. And it's, it's I don't know, maybe 20, 25 minutes uh, south of like the, the Grandview area. Um, so it's a little bit of a drive, but we don't have anything else to do. So we're excited to get out and go do something. I'm really excited. Uh, to see you guys in real time, that those that can make it. It would be a good opportunity to invite friends who are, are looking for uh, something on that day to just to get out and be outside. There's room to spread out. So if, you know, still trying to practice um, a little bit of distancing and, and stay within um, what is wisdom. I uh, was talking with Kip yesterday via text, and uh, they're very confident we're well within their county's guidelines for meeting there. Uh, they actually had a wedding there yesterday. So, you know, some people have said, oh, are you kind of skirting the rules? And no, we're actually playing by the rules. I, I think that's important and we want to do it that way. But this, we're allowed to do this. And uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, teaching will be okay, but I'm really looking forward to worshiping with people. That is something that I have missed um, big time, big time, more than probably anything else. Continuing with our thoughts on the Great Commission, a real quick recap of what we talked about the last couple of weeks, if you've missed. We talked about the fact that the Great Commission is found multiple times in the Bible. It's not like it's one little passage or maybe even two little passages. Uh, it's over and over. Jesus would have said, you know, I've been talking about this ever since I came back from the dead. In fact, even before that, he was referencing what he was calling them to do. This is not some little condensed plan that he threw together. This is Jesus's plan for your life that we're talking about. Another thing that we talked about a couple of weeks ago is that one of the, um, quirk of this grand endeavor is that the only real holdup in it happening is laborers. Jesus saw the exponential growth of the church coming and how people would be hungry for freedom and that uh, circumstances would move in such a way that they, their hearts would be drawn to him. And he said, pray that people would be sent into the, the, the fields to reap the harvest because the harvest is going to be there the shortage is going to be on laborers, not on the availability of those who are willing to give their hearts to him. The uh, third thing we talked about a little bit was that the message of the Great Commission is the message of the rule of God. It is the kingdom of God coming forth, and the kingdom of God being the rule of God, that he would rule first in the hearts of men and eventually all across the earth when he returns. We declare to a lost world that you have a king that he is kind, and that he is coming. And you need to prepare your hearts for that coming. So we've talked a little bit about those things. Today we're going to talk about the activity of the Great Commission. What does it look like in an active way? And a little bit of a, a rebuke that he tied into the giving of the Great Commission. The activity of the Great Commission, how do we spread the message of the rule of God? When you get ready to go back into work, and you walk into those cubicles, and you see people whose lives are every bit of a mess as you were when you shut down, or uh, maybe even more so, they're in hopeless situations. How do we explain to people in that crisis that God is in charge, he's always been in charge, and to submit their life to him in a time of struggle changes anything? Because many of them are going to say, you know what, if, if God loves us, where has he been through all of this? And so our goal is to show them that to submit to him to allow him to rule in their lives actually makes a difference. And sometimes the body of Christ is long on goals, but short on tactics, okay? We, we have lots of lofty goals, but not always really good tactics. I was a part of a denomination um, years ago that after years of decline, uh, decided that they were gonna set a goal for winning a large number of people to the Lord and opening a bunch of churches and uh, they called it the decade of harvest. That's what they were going to call this thing, this decade of harvest. And they talked about it. Uh, I, I think it started in 1990. And they it's all they talked about in 1989. I was talking with Kelsey this morning. She goes, no, no, they were talking about that like in 1986 when I was in high school. And so they talked about for years leading into this decade of harvest. 
of when they were going to uh, plant a bunch of churches, win a bunch of people to the Lord. I remember my senior year of Bible college, there being this massive banner on the back of the chapel wall of the decade of harvest. I graduated in 1999. It started in 1990. And in the year 2000 came around and the numbers were totaled. It was clear that they had started fewer churches in that decade than they had in the decade before. They had actually continued to decline. They said, well, how, how can that happen? I mean, you had a decade of harvest. These were not ungodly people. They were not lazy people. They were not without gifts or sincerity. But it was clear that the decade of harvest was more about goals than tactics. And goals are good. You can't be effective without having goals. But goals without tactics are really just wishes. And they had wishes, but they didn't have tactics. And Jesus didn't just lay out a goal to his followers. He didn't just say, you know, it would be great if you could go reach the world. He actually talked tactics with them. The goal is to represent the rule of God to people. What are the tactics that he talked about? How do we get there? If the message of the Great Commission is the rule of God all across the earth, beginning in our own hearts, what is the activity of the Great Commission? What did he expect that we would actually be doing? The activity of the Great Commission is making disciples. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew 28. 18 through 20, and we're going to spend uh, the bulk of our time there this morning. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. A body of believers that is embracing the call of Jesus to share the rule of God everywhere, which is what his great commission is, is a group that will embrace the task of making disciples. Now, in 30 years of ministry, we've seen the church do a lot of things. A lot of them are wonderful. Some of them are iffy. But little of it has been strategic about making disciples. And it's not because the church was not well-intentioned or wasn't busy trying something. It just isn't something that the church itself is focused on, on making disciples. When I look back at my own formal Christian education in four years of Bible college, I don't remember there being a lot of talk about discipleship. I remember them preparing us to minister to people in crisis, care for people, and also to preach as best we could. But that legitimate desire to care for people sometimes left us failing to help them mature in the knowledge and the practices of God. Or as Jesus said, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. So that people's responses sometimes in difficult times, like we are seeing right now, are not the responses that a child of God should be having. It's not because they don't love God. It's not because they haven't been active in church. It's not because they're not busy with church activity. It's that they've not been discipled. They've been taught what to believe, but they've not been taught how it should affect their everyday walk in life, and allowing it to affect their everyday walk is the only way that their faith can really be truly sustainable in difficult times. Some of you in this season have been surprised at how shaky your faith has been. You've been, you've been in the faith 15, 20 years, and you've gone, I thought I would do better than this. I thought I'd be more solid in what I believed. I thought I wouldn't grow as discouraged so quickly. It's because at times we have spent significant seasons in the church, but we've not spent significant seasons in discipleship relationships. In the early uh, 1990s, there was great concern about the character of our nation. Uh, a lot of talk about where we were going as a culture. And William Bennett, who had been the Secretary of Education under Ronald Reagan, and later, uh, uh, Bush won, I believe, made him the drug czar. In between those two jobs, he grew very concerned about the character of people. And so he published a book that he called The Book of Virtues, great big, thick book. And it was a series of stories that would um, uh, help you exercise virtue. And it talked about the fact that honesty really is the best policy, that hard work really is a reward unto its own, and that empathy really does go a long way in bringing peace. And how, it talked about how these things, when they are implemented, they work in people's lives. Just like there are a, a book of virtues, there are principles that Jesus taught that when we embrace them and implement them, will change our lives. 
Studying or believing them doesn't mean much. Implementing them is everything. He taught on the Sermon on the Mount that there is a blessedness or a happiness to meekness. You can understand that, but until you understand meekness in your life, you don't understand the happiness that it brings. He talked about spiritual hunger and thirst and that it, there's a satisfaction that comes with being spiritually hungry. And you can understand that cognitively, but until you're hungry, you don't understand what it means to receive from the Lord. These are things that are disciplines in our life. These are not wiring. The idea of purity in heart is not a wiring in our life or being a peacemaker. We're not wired that way. Those are disciplines that we develop. And that's actually really good news because if I'm talking about these things and you're thinking, those are not very active in my life, doesn't mean they can't be. Doesn't mean you can't grow in these areas. If these were inherent wiring, if the Sermon on the Mount only relied on how we were wired, then the Sermon on the Mount's no more valuable than things like the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs. But that's not what it is. These are things that we can discipline and develop in our own lives. When you start talking about discipline and, and making these things matter in your life in the way of discipleship, some people immediately think about legalism. Well, I, I don't want to be forced into legalism. I don't want to it being all about uh, how I act. But the truth is how we act demonstrates what our faith is. And when our actions and our faith come into alignment, we step into a, a, a growth season in our lives that leaves us stronger for it because our behavior matches our faith. Yes, faith and salvation is, a, is, a, is asking Jesus into our heart. But we want to bring more to the world than just salvation. It's not just about being saved. It's about being Christ-like. The drunk laying in the gutter can whisper a prayer, and he is saved instantly, but that's not the legacy he wants to leave for the world. No, we want maturity in Christ in the way of discipleship, and so does God. That's what he wants for us. Ephesians 4. 11 and 13 is, is a passage that I go back to a lot. You've heard me read it a number of times. When you, when you see me circling these passages, just know there's probably a series coming because that's how I get to those. But I love this passage, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. They're discipling people for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. He said, I put people in your lives with ministry gifts, and I put you around people so that you would mature. He wants everyone saved, but he also wants them mature like his son is mature. He was so committed to the idea of maturity as a process that even Jesus matured as a human being. I don't understand that, okay? Like that messes with me to think about the fact that Jesus matured. But Luke 2, 52 says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus matured. I, like that blows my mind. How was Jesus, who was fully God, yet grew in a human body, even with a human mind, did a three-month-old Jesus as an infant have profound theological thoughts? I, I would think not. But even if he did, he couldn't communicate them. He had to mature in that. Why all of that talk about maturity and even outlining the idea that Jesus matured? Because it is God's goal for your life that you would mature, and it's more than just making a decision. Maturity is by discipline, and discipline is the root of discipleship. We embrace faith in God in a moment, but we embrace adherence to following Jesus and growing stronger in him and, and developing our ability to walk in hard times, one good or one bad decision at a time. By this time tomorrow, you will have made 10 decisions on the pathway to discipleship. You're like, no, I won't. Yes, you will. You will wake up and you will see something on TV that you realize, you know what, I, I don't need to be exposed to this. And whether you press off or turn it up is a decision regarding discipleship. 
the Lord will prick your heart to think you should call somebody. And you'll think, you know what, I'm tired. I don't have the energy right now. I should, but I won't. It's a discipleship matter of obedience to him. You'll make 10 decisions by tomorrow morning. Honestly, if you get six out of 10, you're probably doing great. You're not going to get everyone right. But as we begin to respond to his promptings and walk in obedience to him and develop that strength, we are embracing discipleship and maturity that we have not seen in the past. Now, if this idea of embracing discipleship on a day-to-day -day basis, even in your own walk, or the pursuit of maturity in your life has not taken root, some of you are going, I feel like he's reading my journal. No, if it has not taken root in your life, you're 20 years, 30 years in the Lord, and you're going, yeah, I don't feel like I've matured that much. It's not entirely your fault. Um, one of the ideas that I've talked about for years, and I didn't even realize it until Steve pointed it out, that I, Steve Hickey pointed out, I've used this, this phrase over and over, is the idea of uh, what I call the conventional church or, or an unconventional church. And when I refer to uh, a conventional church, this is kind of what I'm talking about. We think of conventional ways as the normal way of doing things, the common way of doing things, the best way, because we've always done it that way before. It's just conventional. We've always done it that way. Uh, one young bride always cut the ends off of her roast. Every time she made a roast, she cut the ends off, put it in the oven. And her husband asked her one time, why do you cut the ends off a roast? She said, that's just how you make a roast. He said, why? She said, well, it's just how you make a roast. It was the conventional way of doing it for her. He leaves the kitchen. She called her mom. She said, mom, why do we cut the ends off a roast before we cook it? She goes, oh, I did that because my pan was too small. It was the conventional way. It's the way the lady had always been taught of making a roast. There was no real reason to do it. It's just the way it had always been done. And when I talk about the conventional church, there are things that we do in church that pass for the expression of Christ in many places that are really much less than he is calling a bride to be. But it's just conventional. It's the way we've always done it. And it's maybe not inherently bad. There's nothing inherently bad with cutting the ends off the roast. You just don't have to do it that way. And there maybe is a better way to do it. Much of the activity of what I would refer to as the conventional church in our culture involves, uh, here's another made up word, saints entertainment. That's where you look at the saints and you think, uh, rather than what do they need, we think, what would they like? What would they like to go to? What would they like to attend? And that's how we make our decisions on the programming in church sometimes. What would they like rather than what they need. And it could be that the pastor is motivated by fear or security or even out of the best intentions. It's done out of the best intentions of serving the needs of the body. What do people like to do? And it's largely not a bad thing. It's just not the main thing. And if you can only do one thing, do the main thing. The main thing is not the comfort of the crowd or the saints entertainment of the crowd. The main thing is the growth of individuals in the crowd. And if the individuals aren't growing, even if the crowd is growing, you're not building the church. Now, I don't believe we have to choose between the, the dichotomy that I'm going to give you right now, but let me just, to get our heads around this, I would rather see a small group of people discipling one another than a huge group held together by a music or preaching style that have no intention of making life adjustments. Now, again, I don't think you have to choose between that. I think you can have both. But let's go deep with a few before we end up out forced into the shallows just to get the many. Now, nothing would make me happier. Let me see how many places we have turned on. Say, okay, there's 30 different places on Zoom right now. Okay, so a couple of those are in my house. So there's, call it 25 places on Zoom right now. Who knows how many at that? I would love if we'd gather back up. There's 50. More is better, providing you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. But I don't want to pursue a many at the expense of the few growing and going deep with the Lord. That if, if we can get 25 people discipled, sold out for Jesus, the potential of what they can do in their own worlds is exponentially greater than a hundred people not discipled, but just enjoying a speaker. It doesn't mean that much to me. Now, because we have options with our time, first of all, I'm always, I'm amazed we have 30 different locations on here because there's a million things that you have to do today and you chose to sit down to, you know, listen to a strange little bald man rant in front of a grove of trees where he's not really even at. 
but we're all busy. And, and it means we all have things that we really have to do. Everybody's got to sleep some. Everybody's got to work some. Laundry does not fold itself. All of these things that we have to do, that the hours that we have that are optional are, are limited. And because they're limited, we're very protective of our schedules. We don't want to waste a minute, so we guard our calendar. We don't have the capacity or the desire to be fully open-handed with our time. Nobody does. How many of you wave to me? Do you remember daytimers? Remember daytime? We flipped there. Anybody remember daytimers? Some of you are too young to remember daytimers. Daytimers were uh, before we had phones and calendars. You can't see my phone because of the background. Oh, this is weird. Okay. Before we had phones, uh, we had daytimers. They were like leather little binding things and your calendar was in it and you kept great track of that thing. And the other night I was thinking about daytimers. And I thought, I wonder if they even make daytimers anymore. Like, is that, Julie, is that a real daytimer? Or is that a, a, a cal written calendar? Okay. It, it, an iteration of it. Yes. Still okay. Iteration of the daytimer. Right. And, and I got to wondering that, I wonder if that even exists anymore. Like, I wonder if you could buy a daytimer. I went online. The company still exists. They're selling the exact same product they were selling 20 years ago. And so there was a, a cartoon back in the heyday of daytime. Back before smartphones, everybody had one, and it was proof you were busy because you had to write stuff down. And in the cartoon, it was an advertising campaign, actually, a mugger steps out of the shadows and points a gun at this busy executive and says, your daytimer or your life? And the guy replies, uh, can I have a few minutes to think about it? Because our schedules mean something to us, Okay. But in the same spirit of that, the Lord steps out of the shadows and he uses a disaster like a pandemic to blow up our calendars. So to pry our day timers or our cell phones from our cold dead hands and say, OK, you're not so busy now. All the mischief you were getting into, all the saints entertainment that you were availing yourself to. Yeah, that all got canceled. So now what are you doing with your time? And in this divine reset. The great task facing the church in months to come, I've been thinking about this all week, the great task facing the church is not reassembling and asking the crowd what they would like. The great task before the church is to ask people what are they going to need. And people are going to be forced into positions of vulnerability where they're honest about what they need in those interactions and what they need when they do share what they need and they are strengthened and they're challenged by other believers discipleship takes place and it's not always programmed the virus done broke the program the programs aren't going to be executed like they used to be what does discipleship look like it looks like life on life it looks like people connecting with people in a real way and asking them hard questions how are you really don't give me don't give me the you know two minute before zoom answer when uh, we were all gathered together. Nobody's going to be honest in that. How are you doing in real life? It happens in smaller groups, and some of you are going to have to force your way into one. I mean, you're going to have to make an effort to connect with people. It doesn't come naturally to you, and I understand that maturity doesn't come naturally either, but that's what we're going after. Friday night, we gathered uh, for prayer online. If, if you haven't uh, gathered with us, join us. It, it really is a, it's a great time. And we gathered for prayer, um, and it's a smaller group than this, so it's way easier to talk, and, and uh, I would hope that it gets to be a bigger group, so we have to do multiple meetings. I'm happy with that. But in that, we prayed for one another, and we're also vulnerable. And I got off that, and I said, you know what? That's not just a prayer meeting. That's a discipleship meeting. We shared encouragement with one another. We challenged one another. We prayed for one another. We shared life with one another. We have... I think we have too great of an expectation of formal discipleship. And there are great programs for discipleship, but they all, all they do is artificially work to produce what we wish we had in the natural, which is a real person asking us, how are we? And are we really walking out our faith? And do we know what the Bible says about that? And if you can't find that, then a program is great. But in, these, in this season, when the programs all got blown up, it is a season to draw near to one another, to reach out, in addition to these little meetings, and we disciple and grow one another. Matthew 28 continues. Matthew says that Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teaching people to deserve, 
uh, to observe what Jesus commanded. Somehow that has been interpreted as only pulpit ministry or Zoom ministry or something like that. But Jesus, he preached sermons, but more often than that, he taught his disciples every day as they went along in life. Some of his most important teachings happened at very happenstance times. Luke 11, he's praying, and the disciples say, hey, 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 teach us how to pray. We look at that as the Lord's Prayer. It's very profound teaching. That was not on his schedule. That was just a phone call he received. And he taught them to observe the things that he was doing. Matthew 24, as he leaves the courtyard, he's pointing to buildings, and he's telling his disciples, none of these stones are going to stand on top of one another. He's not preaching to a formal crowd, but he is teaching them about the end of the age. It's almost as if Jesus is teaching on the fly as he goes, pointing out the ways of the kingdom, the rule of God as part of his everyday life. It's almost like he is living out the real spirit of Deuteronomy 11.19. Deuteronomy 11.19 says, you shall teach them, talking about the ways of God, to your children, talking about them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. He is teaching the ways of Jesus is way more often a natural way of conversation with people than it is formal teaching. So to submit to the tactics of the Great Commission is to allow people to speak into your life and to disciple you, and to do the work of the Great Commission is to extend what you have learned in your everyday life and disciple other people. In God's wisdom, he puts us in groups where we are neither the most or the least spiritual person in every situation, and we begin to disciple one another. Discipleship is the activity of the Great Commission. And in doing that, people come to Jesus, and they, they come to faith, and they grow in maturity, and the entire world hears about the kingdom or the rule of God. But it happens way more intricately than just a, if you pray this prayer, everything changes in your life. It's work, and it happens over time. Now, I mentioned last week that I was going to get to it, and I didn't, so I'll get to it real quickly here before, uh, as we tidy up. The idea of a stern warning that he gives them. There are uh, forces and machines that have great power that can be thwarted by a very, very small thing. Example, the space shuttle goes up powered by three engines that produce a half a million pounds of thrust each. So a million and a half pounds of thrust that will launch a space shuttle that weighs how many tons into the air? Yet 1986, 73 seconds into a launch, the Challenger blew up because, anybody remember what failed? An O-rim. It was a quarter of an inch thick. It looked literally, now you probably couldn't have bought this exact one, but it looked like something you could have bought at Ace Hardware. And that little tiny thing brought that entire space shuttle crashing down. It is interesting to me what the kingdom can withstand in the way of oppression and persecution, oppressive governments, financial pressures, things that happen around the world and the church marches on, and yet what seemingly small things can bring the kingdom to a screeching halt. There was among the disciples this nagging issue that kept rearing its head even after the resurrection. Even after they saw Jesus die and they put him in a tomb and they saw him walking alive afterwards, the issue would continue to resurface a number of times. It wasn't a lack of love for Jesus. It wasn't an issue with one another. It wasn't even, it wasn't even that they didn't want to believe. It is that some of them occasionally struggled with doubt. And at first, Jesus made room for it or at least he was patient for it. He didn't address it directly initially. Uh, you know, some of the most helpful parenting advice we ever got was uh, two parts. One, you have to enforce every rule when you see an infraction. When you see an infraction, you have to enforce every rule. Second of all, sometimes you choose not to see an infraction. Meaning, you know, if the rules is you punch your brother, you sit in the corner for an hour, and everybody is heading out to the van and you're late for something, you see somebody get punched sometimes, you just don't see that infraction. And it's almost like Jesus overlooked this at one point. In Luke 24, 41, it says, While they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, so they had some doubt, he replied to them, Do you have anything to eat? Like, he just kind of moved on. He saw that they're in disbelief, but he doesn't mention it. 
Uh, that disbelief there for joy is the kind of disbelief of it's almost too good to be true. Jesus doesn't even refer to it in this context. He just asks them for fish sticks, okay? He doesn't even think about the fact that they're struggling with doubt. Another time in Mark 16, we read about multiple count, accounts of disbelief. There's one earlier than this passage, but in Mark, Mark uh, 16, 11, and 12 says, but when they heard he was alive, and they it had been seen by her, or the woman who, who realized it, they would not believe. And after these things, he appeared to them in another form to two of them while they were walking in the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. So here we've got examples of those who were close to Jesus, who understood all of his teaching, and realized that he had resurrected, but they were expressing doubt. It is easy 2,000 years later to be critical of people who doubted him. Okay, it's just kind of easy. Let's be fair, if you had been following him around the countryside after three years of miracles and hearing him teach, when his body disappears, is your first thought, oh, he came back to life? No, you could understand they were a little bit doubtful. But the tone shifts a little bit a few verses later in Mark 16, where Jesus suddenly strongly addresses their doubt. And I think the reason that he addresses it here is because it is in context to the commission. He's getting ready to share the Great Commission with them in Mark 16, 14. And afterward, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for, hardness of, for unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Up until this point, they hadn't seen him physically, but here he is, and he says, I'm here now, and he rebukes their unbelief and their hardness of heart. He's about to lay out a mission to them, and it's almost as if he says, if you want to just be around me and entertain the intellectual exercise of redemption, then go ahead and doubt and ask all those theological questions. You're not hurting anybody, but if you're going to step into my calling for your life, then your doubt and your hardness of heart is going to have ramifications far beyond your own life, and we've got to deal with it right now. What he's rebuking here is not just the idea that Jesus is too good to be true. It is a hardness of heart that says, even if it is true, I don't know if it matters. When you look truth right in the eye and you continue to entertain a lie as a viable option, the only way you can maintain that lie is for doubt to grow in your heart and your heart to grow hard. And somewhere along the line, even within the church, we begin to treat doubt like a virtue. Like we applaud people for their great honesty in doubting as if that is their highest calling. Uh, some years ago, we went to a visit a church where we had been on staff for a while, and it had changed significantly, significantly in our, our season of being gone. Most of the pastoral staff had changed over, and, uh, but I didn't realize how different it was. And the staff pastor who was preaching was speaking on the idea of doubt, which is, you know, as am I, so a completely valid topic. But he, out of a 20-minute sermon, probably spent 14 minutes explaining that he had a lot of doubts. In fact, at one point he said, I think I probably have more doubts than the rest of you. And I wanted to stand up and go, well, why are you up there then? Like, if, if you're still struggling with doubt, maybe you should sit down. Not to say that we don't ever struggle with doubt and everything, but when you step into a calling to do it with doubts in your own heart, actually is dangerous. Jesus rebuked it. Because he said, if you step into ministry while harboring questions of your own, not that you're going to get every question answered, but you are still more of a doubter than you are a believer, the only way you can maintain that is to make your heart hard. Doubts among people who should know better lead to hardness of heart. And the Great Commission cannot be trusted to hard hearts. It was meant for tender ones. Hardness of heart is a unique condition of religious people not the unreligious. It's a position of the initiated who have seen the Lord and then make their heart hard, not the ignorant who have not seen the Lord. Early in Mark 10, religious people were pestering Jesus about divorce on a technicality. And they argued from the Old Testament that allowing for a divorce was able, and Jesus presented kind of a kinder approach to marital harmony, a higher standard rather than the law, and they threw the old law back in his face. And Jesus replied to them in Mark 10, 5, it's because of your hardness of heart that he wrote the law to begin with. 
He says, you've grown religious and hard in your heart. Hardness of heart is not just the result of sin. Some of the most sinful people that we know can actually have tender hearts. That's why people can go into a bar and feel like they find community. Hardness of heart comes from a familiarity with the truth, truth and then a disregard for it. It comes from knowing that Jesus is alive, but not following through on the calling that he's given us. Some of us have struggled with hard heart. We've been, we've been in church for years, seen it all, done it all. Frankly, I'm a little jaded. That hardness of heart comes from not getting involved in the great commission of what he has called you to do. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be any evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort another, everyone every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In these days when everything is changing, the list of things that are not changing is more important than ever before. And one of the things that is not changing is that he calls those that want to step into maturity with him to a tenderness of heart, not a hardness of heart. And let me just encourage you, if you found yourself struggling with a, just a shell over your heart in this season, you've grown hard towards people, you've grown hard towards what the Lord says, he is challenging you to depth and maturity because he knows that hardness of heart pays really negative dividends in your life long term and in the lives of those that you are called to reach. Our commission is to extend the rule of God in our lives and in others, and that doesn't change. The tactic of discipleship in one another's lives, that doesn't change. And the admonition to guard ourselves against unbelief or doubt because it makes our hard heart, that doesn't change. I want to just take a minute, and I want to pray for those that are maybe struggling. And you've realized, you know what? My discipleship game in my own life and in the life of others is not what it has needed to be, and I want it to be. I just want to pray briefly, and then we're going to open up the mics. If anybody has anything to share, observation, anything we need to pray for, for you, we would be happy to do that. So it's a great time to connect. Otherwise, we're just looking at little boxes, and so we want to hear from you as well. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you ask for tender hearts among your people, and you provide for tenderness. So we challenge doubt in our own lives. We ask you to move and to make those corrections in our own lives that we would lean into maturity and discipleship. That even as we talk and pray about this and think about it, we would think of names of people who need an encounter with you at a level they've never, ever had before. And how that we could challenge them to that. Help us to grow in our own discipleship as we extend your kingdom and your rule in our life and everywhere that we go and we are seen. In Jesus' name, amen.